Hello and welcome. I am Anna, and this is a new episode of Project Co, the podcast channel of Efecto Colibri, a channel inspired by words that start with co, community, consciousness, co-creation, co-evolution, and of course, colibri, which in Spanish means hummingbird. We have honest conversations with change makers to explore mindsets and initiatives for positive change. The stories we tell and the stories we listen to have the power to regenerate our perception of ourselves and others. Stories regenerate. This is why at Efecto Colibri, we produce and distribute podcast content to inspire you to create a more human reality in harmony with planet Earth. Discover more at www.effectocolibri.com. Dr. Vamuyu Mahinda, I would like to start by quoting it. Transformational impact in Africa can only result from organizations working in collaboration rather than competitive silos. What a sentence. I believe this is true for the whole world. Operating in silos guide us to polarization, hate and destruction. We see it in the current dividing narratives. Race, religion, politics. Dr. Vamuyu Mahenda, you are pioneering new ways to break through these silos. You are the co-chair of Catalyst 2030 Africa region and managing partner and convener of Collaborative Value Partners Africa, from where you work to bring people together to co-create homegrown solutions that are only possible through collaborative value. Dr. Vamuyu Mahinda, what a pleasure to have you on board on Proyecto Co. Welcome. Thank you. What would you say drives you in life? Well, I think there are a number of drivers. Um, the most critical driver is impact of the work that I do. And um, the impact can be at different levels. It can be at my family level. I'm a family member. I'm a mother of three. <laughs> and um, I like to see my children grow and uh, make an impact. And the other level of impact is at my work. I believe that um, if we are to continue working day in, day out, we have to make an impact. And if that impact is not there, then we might as well stay at home and do nothing. <laughs> yeah, totally. And um, what would you say is one of the things that makes you most proud? I'm proud of small and big things. I I I feel very good when I spend time mentoring. I do mentor young people. And um, there's nothing that gives me more joy than seeing a person that I've mentored um, shift from where they were and grow and then develop wings and they no longer need me, you know, and, and make it in life. So when I even meet them, sometimes they stop me on the on the streets and they're like, oh, Amoyo, oh, Dr. Amoyo, depending on how they want to call me. Then uh, they're oh, you remember you are my teacher? here and there, or you remember you mentored me in this area, and I'm, I never forget the work that, you know, you put on me. Because of that, I am who I am today. So that makes me very, very proud of, of who I am and, and what I've done in the lives of many young people. That's, that's actually kind of the, the most humble mission that one, can, that one can embark on, you know, to accompany somebody else to become a better version of themselves. Sure, definitely, yeah. And um, I have done that for many years because um, for some reason uh, I am in the space of supporting young people. I find that um, even as I am no longer a young person, I've done this from when I was younger to, to now. And um, even when I am doing work either in the community or, or in the rural areas that I go to, I always identify with young people and uh, I'm able to pull them out of their space and um, where they are willing to learn. They learn from we, where they want to grow. I support them to grow. And uh, even when we say that sometimes young people have challenges that uh, we all are aware of, they also have the capacity to to learn and to grow and to really improve on themselves when you give them the time to or the space. Uh, that works for them, I must say. Let's talk about the context, no? Like, um, which would you say are the main challenges that young people face? Okay, like now we... I know that in the last discussion I had with um, some of my colleagues, we were talking about the Gen Zs, the Who's, you know, the different, sta the different um, stages um, of young people. 
And uh, one of the challenges that um, my colleagues being employers were talking about is the fact that the, the young people currently don't have um, the staying value. I mean, they, 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 they do jobs for a very short time. They get bored very easily and they, they just move on. They, they are not able to stay in a place and, you know, ensure that uh, they grow and they, they, they raise up the ladder if it's an organization or that they learn enough to be able to move to the next level. So they get impatient and quickly move to other, to other organizations. So that's one area of challenge uh, for young people. But uh, at the same time, the, the young people, because they're very innovative, if you don't allow them space to be innovative, they also take off because they're like, I can't, you know, I, I can't do it in this space. This space is, doesn't, you know, allow me to be who I want to be. And uh, much as it's, uh, it's positive, it's also negative in the sense that um, sometimes you need to be in a space long enough for people to trust you to innovate for them. So if you don't have the patience to stay long enough to be appreciated and for your skills to be appreciated, then you see that, that, and that is a challenge uh, that makes it difficult, uh, for both young people and the people employing them. Um, young people are also in a way, um, should I say they, they have their own mind and, uh, sometimes their own mind is not in line with the strategy. <laughs> that, <laughs> so, so you see, there's a conflict of interest because they want to do this thing. And then there's a strategy that requires them to do something totally different. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, so anyway, but I, I love to young, to work with young people because I, I think they, they have a lot to offer, um, when they're allowed the space to, to do that. Um, and sometimes that space, is not the, the normal space. It's like you have to think out of the box to be able to work with them. It's not business as usual when you work with young people because a lot of time you have to allow them to let you know how how best they can operate. And it's not easy. Um, I do have young people that work for me and um, sometimes they're off. They, they just uh, go off in terms of they are not able to perform at certain time of the month, say, for example. And um, I have learned to to allow them that space because it's sometimes it's not for long, maybe a day or two, they're just completely off. Something happens. I'm not sure what that is because I'm not young anymore. <laughs> but when they come back to now themselves and, um, and are ready to work, then they're able to put up even extra time to do the work. So that's what I'm saying. Sometimes it's just understanding them and being able to support them as they go through their own phases. And ensuring that when they are on the app, you work well with them. When they're on the low, you try to find out how you can support them to get out of that low. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes, at the end, it's um, it's innovating in the structures, no? Um, in this, the, the, I have the feeling that right now we're going through a phase in which um, the old paradigms are uh, still like um, trying to maintain the status quo. But there is a parallel current, no, in in every dimension of reality, be it social innovation, um, the respect of uh, minorities, no, like uh, we are kind of seeing a new currency of people who are like opening up their minds to a completely different set of values, no, and the old paradigm is um, staying staying away. And what you're saying about um, playing the game, no, and um, with young people and the strategy, which is something you know, that may seem like opposing values, may actually create a very integrative and much more innovative and suitable to our reality um, paradigm, which is more suitable to our reality. Yes, I, I totally agree that um, the result of all these uh, conflicting interests can be positive, but it can also be negative. So I think it, it all depends on how, how things move. And just looking at the work I'm currently doing on, um, collaboration. Um, this is a space that calls for a different mindset where, um, you accept that you are better working with other people than working alone. Now, when we were, you know, in a few years, a few years ago, the collaboration was not as much as, as, as it is now. I mean, the realization of the importance of collaboration is, is a new thing. And, um, I find that the younger people, therefore embracing collaboration faster than the older people. Because, and especially if you remember 
um, even the description of entrepreneurs, even by the founders of entrepreneurship, it was that it's this person who has got, you know, innovation, self, you know, have, has a, should I say, um, a motivation to accomplish a certain, if it's a social change or, you know, a change in, in lives of, you know, people, environmental, climate change, whatever they, you know, there's an innovation that's very critical. And, and this, you know, entrepreneur wants to do something about it. So it was based on individuals being able to make a difference in a certain area. So when you come to these individuals, for example, and tell them to be able to do more and to scale, you need to collaborate. That didn't all go well with them. And then and, and you can't blame them because they have this idea that they want to make happen. And they are wondering how they bring other people to do it. So that, and that is why collaboration is not automatic. Sometimes I find that in, since this is my area of expertise, I have to allow people to discover how that collaboration supports them. Because, for example, there are other people doing the same thing as you're doing. So we are not asking you to collaborate and change how you're thinking. It, it, it is that when you collaborate, you're able to be on the lookout for other people doing exactly what you're doing or supporting what you're doing. And therefore, when you collaborate with it, it propels the work you're doing to the next level. The person you're collaborating, it could also be a person who has to learn about your work. And as they learn about your work, they also support you in the work that you want to do. So it, it, it takes a mind shift. And uh, that mind shift ensures that when, when you accept the mind shift, it means that you have accepted what comes with bringing more people into the space, this space that you're working. So, and uh, I, when I, because I, I do have models, I have models that we have designed that are to help people to collaborate because we have come to realize that Collaboration is not automatic. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. It's not easy either. So the question is, what do you want? Some people say, we just want to associate with other people. That is still collaboration. So why do you want to see it associate with other people? What is it that you want to get from the association with other people? And we help them think through that. Others say, we want to share resources. We believe we have certain resources and we have gaps in certain resources and we believe that by bringing in other people, we also build the resources because then we have resources from different people and we build this to the next level. Then the question is, are you ready to share the cake? Because once everybody brings their resources and you form one, 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 you have one, one big cake. Are you willing to share that cake? You know, because then if you can, then that, then you're in the right direction. You're, you're moving in the right direction, but you want to bring these resources and still have the cake to yourself. But then obviously that collaboration will not work. Yeah. And, um, that is where we talk about, for example, having synergistic, you know, um, collaborations, because we're saying we synergize and we get this one result that is as a result of everybody coming together. And, uh, in understanding that the people collaborating appreciate that two plus two is no longer four. It is five because then this collaboration has built the synergy the, the, in that in such a way that there is um, more to gain by coming together than it is when you work alone. So that training is is what we take people through, and um, those who understand are beginning to appreciate the results of coming together and collaborating to ensure that there is a change that everybody is working towards. I found it fascinating, really, and. Uh, I believe, I strongly believe it is the way to go, no? And if I look at, for instance, a Catalyst 2030, even Effecto Colibri, no? What we, we started from scratch, only interviewing people and sharing to their knowledge with other people. And that's how we built the project that we have right now. And the same is with Catalyst. It is at the end, sharing this mindset, know that together, I love what you said about Two plus two is five. No, how? I mean, I have a couple of questions that come to my mind. First, what does collaboration mean to you? No, and how? Which? How would you categorize the different types of collaboration? Are there different types of collaboration? Yes. Um, so, collaboration maybe they, they, everybody could interpret it differently. I mean, there are people who would say it's coming together to share what we have, and and they are, and they are right. The others who say 
it is building something together for change, for transformational change or for systems change. The others who say it is coming together to co-create because then you have the skills, the other one has different skills and together we co-create and then we co-create this good thing that gives us satisfaction as different co-creators. And all those are correct. So I, so my question always is, you want to collaborate. What's the end game? Because then the end game is what determines how you collaborate. What, and for example, if it's Catalyst 2030, they say the end game is systems change. Then systems change is pretty deep, you know, because then you're looking at different parts, different aspects of collaboration. We are looking at the policies. What are the policies that are guiding this collaboration? Whether it is at country level, whether it is at organizational level, what are the policies? And the policies are key for the systems change. What are the resources that we are looking at? And not just money, your human resources. So what, how are the disflows of those resources? Human resources, uh, uh, funds, and any other resource that we are looking at depending on which area of work we are at. Then we're looking at the practices. Are we changing our practices? Is it business as usual? Or are we changing how we're doing work? Are we therefore co-creating because those are practices? Are we um, ensuring that we associate with the right people so that we have the end result that we want, we're looking for? So all those practices are different. If you're looking at, for example, climate change, are we saying we're planting more trees? Are we, are we saying that we are training people to, uh, to ensure that they don't damage trees and therefore change practices because then, for example, they're not cutting trees for charcoal, but are instead using renewable energy. So those are the practices we are talking about. So it, it you know, it, it calls for a lot of practices to change depending on what it is that you want to achieve. Then there is the mental models. And, and you remember I talked about the fact that that is an area that um, the young people are um, sometimes very good at and sometimes more difficult at depending on what it is that you want them to change. But um, we must think in a particular way to achieve the collaboration that we want to achieve, especially for systems change. We, it cannot be that we are thinking the same we were thinking, we're doing the same things we're doing, that the culture is exactly the same culture, that we continue to cut t- trees and still expect the tree cover to increase. No, 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 it, it's not possible. We must uh, change how we do things, we must ch- change how we perceive things, we must cook differently. If we, we are cooking with um, firewood and charcoal, we must change that and ensure that we are using other sources of energy. So, so, so collaboration, like I said, depending on what you want to achieve, determines what happens here in between. Yeah, because if I just want to co-create with you, um, that's a simple collaboration. We sit down over a, a week or two days, co-create whatever it is we are co-creating and move on. If you're looking at transformation or change, which is what we are doing for uh, my organization, Collaborative Value Partners Africa, our end goal is transformation or change in Africa. We cannot talk about transformation or change when we are, it's, it's, it's not a shallow, a, a shallow result. It's a deep result that calls for us to dig deep into our culture, dig deep into how we do things, dig deep into the policies that are, that are, ad, you know, advising us on how to move forward and, uh, and so on. So that is important. Yeah. Could you share with us a couple of projects that you have been working on or that, that you are proud of that what went well and what did you learn throughout the process? Um, currently, uh, uh, my organization is, is a partner because obviously we are collaborating. <laughs> <laughs> Good. There is coherence there. <laughs> With, uh, um, an organization called Trust to Impact, which is, um, focusing on climate change. In fact, very specifically water, energy, health nexus in uh, one of the counties in Kenya. In this collaboration, we as the collaborative partners, because we are the, we as collaborative value partners are the ones forming the partners for this collaborative, uh, should I say project. We, we brought together 22 partners. Um, and, and, and these 22 partners, some are implementing partners. Others are, um, knowledge partners, universities and, and so on and research uh, organizations. Others are private sector partners that have knowledge in some of the areas that we are, that are important to us. And, uh, and the others are experts in, say, for example, agroforestry, uh, afforestation and so on. So in this project, 
um, we, we are proud that we have been able to bring 22 partners together because that's, you know, part of what we, our mandate is. And, uh, in addition to that, we continue to, um, should I say, work together with the different partners, depending on it, what it is that we want to achieve. So, uh, in this county, one of the things we want to do is to harvest, or should I say, I don't know whether you see you're harvesting carbon credits or whether you, <laughs> sometimes the language is, we, do, we are not experts in everything. That's why we have experts in, in, uh, in carbon credit financing. But, um, because of, uh, the fact that this is important for the community, We've taken time to ensure that even the community understands how, for example, agroforestry can result in financing, you know, carbon credit financing, and how that financing would support their livelihoods as community or as a rural community. So just recently, uh, I was there, I, w- I went to meet uh, um, the young people and also the, the women in the community in that area, and uh, we were able to discuss carbon credit financing and how it will change their livelihoods. And they were totally, totally excited about this. Fantastic. Congratulations. I think it's, it's incredible, especially, especially because you're talking about um, different expertises, different nationalities, different um, levels of um, privilege to a certain degree. No? So there I find it like very interesting. And the question that comes to my mind is, what does it take to have the collaborative mindset how no like do you see uh is there a dependence on having a collaborative mindset with uh, the context that you're coming from or is it something uh, that you can see for instance in the indigenous um, communities more than in 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 some other yes. communities in fact it's interesting that uh, in fact um I must admit that in Africa, collaboration was always there. In the African community, we depended a lot on each other. At every stage of a life of a, a woman or a man, there were people that they were supposed to collaborate with and work with and ensure that the results um, are, are good results that come as a result of thinking from different sides of, you know, uh, different people. Um, that, that, I think, has died with the, with the you know, should I say... Um, time, colonization and so on, because then they started to become so individualistic that everybody's waking up in the morning and thinking, what am I going to do? How do I become this and the other? How do I do this? I, 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 I. So the we thing died. Now, when we then say we need to go back to that collaboration that we understand, it's probably not that easy now because then we have, the, the orientation has been completely different because they are, the people who are there today I grew up with a, with, with a different mentality and a different uh, exposure where then it was an individual way of working. So it is not easy to bring back collaboration. And those who are actually appreciating collaboration more are those who are serious about transformation because they have come to realize that to transform an ecosystem, because they're not transforming your home, it's an ecosystem, then they, you have to be in discussion with all those people in the ecosystem. So, and uh, irrespective of what they do, they have to be part of the discussion that you, or the decisions that you make. If you want people to plant trees, you're not going to plant the trees. You need the community to plant the trees with you. If you want people to harvest less fish so that you don't exploit, you know, or rather, you know, over-exploit fishing, then the people fishing is not you, it's the people who are the lakes. So you need to understand why that is a challenge. And then you have to tell them, now that we don't, you don't want us to, to over, uh, fish, what do we do for an income? You see? So there has to be another discussion about where does the money come from for us to survive? And therefore other people come on board and say, okay, you can do this and the other. So at the end of the day, to be able to achieve this, what you want to do, you bring in everybody. And everybody appreciates that there's a role for each and every person who is part of that collaboration. So the understanding is what makes it easy to collaborate, not a, not a discussion at, at the table. You know, it's not a documents written. It's you know, the actual implementation of things is what actually brings the realization that to be able to achieve this, we must work together. How do you tackle the, the, the what's coming to my mind is ego, no? Like this individualistic and I and the heropreneur that you were referring to at the beginning of the of the talk. Um, 
Is it compatible? Um, there are people who will fall by the roadside. I think I better say that because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can preach and preach and preach, but not everybody will, will necessarily, you know, follow the, the preaching. So those who choose to go on their own, they will just go on their own and, um, they'll get to a point where they can do more. And that's what it is because today we do have people who have been just going on and doing their own thing and they get to a point and they are either satisfied or not, but that's it. Then there'll be those who see the value of collaboration and then they'll run with it. But what also happens is within collaboration, and I can tell you that because I'm in it, there are people who want to be more recognized than others. There are people who say, I, I, it was my idea, or they'll say, it was my, I brought the funding in, or I spent more time, you know, whatever. Um, and those things are there. And by the way, uh, since we manage collaboration, we have to learn to deal with some of these things. So conflicts do occur. It doesn't mean that because you're not collab you're collaborating, there will not be conflicts. Conflicts are always there. So it's managing the conflict. It's managing the egos, like, like you, you ask, you know, because their egos are there. You have to manage the egos. It is also an issue of governance. How are we governing ourselves? Are we following, you know, some understood, you know, governance structure where that uh, allows everybody to feel that they have, a, they have some right? And that uh, they, they are being appreciated and that the, their effort is not taken for granted or they're not stepped all over. So the governance structure is key in ensuring that we have a, a great collaboration among in, in an ecosystem. What have been like the, the, the biggest lessons that you have learned throughout the process of uh, promoting collaboration? Okay, I wear different hats. So let me talk about this now, wearing the hat of the co-chair Africa chapter Catalyst 2030, because then it uh, includes other uh, people that are members of Catalyst 2030. So in looking at um, our members in Africa and then looking at uh, our vision as Catalyst 2030 and, and how we want to collaborate and ensure that we are making systems change, uh, you find that um, we are all at different levels of understanding what collaboration can do or will do for us. And uh, I remember the first time uh, I sat um, in this po leadership position, some of the questions that came to me were, where is the funding? To collaborate, we need funding. So uh, are you looking for funding for us? Because then otherwise we can't go very far. Then uh, my question was, what are you, what do you want to fund? You know, because yes, you may need, need funding, but what do you want to fund? Have you thought through your Collab you know, partners, which, what partners are you working with? What is your, what is the ecosystem that you want to change? Because it is in now putting this. And I said, immediately you identify the correct ecosystem that you want to fund or rather you want to work on. Funding becomes an easier next step because then you can be able to put in a very clear proposal of what it is that you are working on and how, and the, and the kind of transformation change that you want to make. And then now look for funding for that. And, and I find that is what is not so straightforward for a lot of people. It's like they feel they need to have money first to plan, but that, that's not how it works. How it works is that you need to come up with a plan. And, and then uh, look, and by the way, one of the partners in the plan would be a development partner, meaning that the resources would be there. So that's the area that I, I find difficult as a leader of the chapter, that uh, we don't all understand what it is that we need to do to be effective in collaboration. So the other aspect of that is that we sometimes talk too much. And in the sense that we have all these meetings, we have these uh, webinars, we have all these, you know, different things that are happening that are all good. And in some of those is learning that that's new. So people learn different things and that's okay. But it doesn't necessarily result in the kind of transformation or change of systems change that we want to see. And uh, therefore cheating as the, the co-chair for Africa one of the things I would like to see before I exit this seat is some transformational change in at least one ecosystem, you know, whether it is education for use, whether it is jobs, or whether it is climate change, whether it, whatever it is, but at least one ecosystem that has transformed as a result of collaboration through our movement, Qatar 2030. So I'm working on that. Um, I'm just been a coach here for a year now. And, um, it's not easy because then you're talking about, uh, members who are all over Africa and members who are not necessarily giving us enough data 
to know exactly what they're doing because that's important because you need to know what people are doing to see how you can bring them together. But I believe that uh, with, within a short, you know, a few months, we will start putting some things together. And um, I'm not worried about funding because I, I don't have the plan yet. I need to bring the people together so that we have a plan. And then once we have a plan, then we can say, here is a plan. Where is the funding to make the plan work? <laughs> that for me is the next step. Yeah. So, so that, that's where we are at. And um, before that happens, then I will feel that I, I haven't quite um, done enough for, for Catalyst 2030 in this position. Yeah. When you talk about transformational change, what could you dig deeper into that? Like, um, if we are given a scenario, no, we're currently in ABC and I would like it to be like ABC. Okay. I'll talk about, uh, youth employment because that's an area that I'm passionate about. So, um, currently we, every country is trying to create jobs for their youth here in Kenya. In, I think every African country is doing that. And, um, we also have, um, um, development partners like Mastercard Foundation that is also uh, focusing on job creation in Africa. Now, governments or governments are also have, um, departments and, um, even, you know, big projects on youth employment. So what I, I would see as transformational is a scenario where, for example, each country comes together and says, we're thinking about employment at go government level. We are thinking about employment at development partner level. We think we have 20 organizations that are thinking about youth employment. If we can sit together, all those different guys and, and, and organizations and co-create, then I can see the beginning of transformational change because then the resources are there, but everybody's doing the same thing. They are working in silos. And the minute we agree, we can do this together and not work in silos. That for me is the beginning of transformational change. I may not be around when that real transformation happens, but I'm right now around to bring the silos together for transformation or change. If you see what I mean? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you so that, much. That's, that's where I see that going. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for being, doing that. No, because, um, I haven't heard of so many uh, people and experts in collaboration. And I think it's uh, something very disruptive and something very, very necessary, no? Because it's like the impact measurement I mentioned, no? Now it's like, a, it's kind of has become a standard, no? But the way you're doing it in systematizing and measuring everything, it's like, um, is really making it robust and serious and nest and therefore more understandable for, to more people, no? Yeah, sure. So thank you so much for for your work. Thank you. Is there something else you want to share? Um, I think uh, the other important thing in my view is um, bringing the private sector companies to collaboration. We have been collaborating as social entrepreneurs and uh, a lot of NGOs also are, are keen to collaborate. And uh, we haven't brought the private sector companies on board. Yet, I feel that they have a lot of expertise they have resources, they have uh, research, they have done a lot of research, and this is important for collaboration because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to do more research if the research has already been done. We don't want to, to, to do the same thing that private sector co companies have done. So we need to invite them consciously to the table so that uh, they are part of our discussions and they are part of the results that we want to achieve and um, I believe that uh, once we bring the private sector on board, we'll move faster. Because then, as you know, private sector companies don't work unless they can see the, the end game, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then they'll push yeah. us to, to, you know, for us to see the end game. So we need them to be able to, to make um, the kind of impact that we want to make in the long run. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for your time and for all your valuable Thank you. insights. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. It was nice talking to you too. Thank you for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. You can find all the references of the episode on our website, www.effectocolibri.com slash proyectoco. If you liked it, rate us with five stars. 
leave us a comment and share it with your network. This will help us reach more people and make social innovation become the norm. So in advance, a big thank you. If you have questions, feedback, or want to introduce us to a guest for the podcast, you can write us directly at anna.efectocolibri.com. See you next time.